Hey gang, we are in Deadwood, South Dakota. Black Hills, beautiful cemetery, Mount Moriah here. Very famous place. We got Wild Bill Hickok, we got Calamity Jane, we got some others. A lot of famous people here, but we're not here to see or talk about them today. We're here to talk about a rather unknown story, rather not a very popular person, should be a woman. She was, and her husband's buried here. They're unmarked, I must say, right off the bat. They are here, we're pretty sure. Did a lot of research. Speaking of research, I want to thank Cheryl Daggs for helping me when I found this story. She brought us the story of Pearl Starr. She brought us the story of Matthew Teschner, Kimberly Montoya, who in Arizona went off the cliff. And she's, along with Deb and others, mostly Deb, uh, the, the great research, great help. So thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. But again, we're here to talk about a woman named Kitty Leroy. She was an entertainer here. She was a wild woman and pharaoh dealer, like I say, entertainer, dancer, maybe a madame sometimes, hard to say, and all the men wanted her. So let's take a walk. We're gonna look at some stones and monuments on the way. We're gonna get a real feel for the famous Mount Moriah Cemetery here in Deadwood. Just walking up here, I'm near the top, and it is just a stunning place. That's if you're into cemeteries, you gotta come. So let's talk about Kitty, but let's first talk about this town of Deadwood. Now it was a year after Horatio Ross had joined up with General George Armstrong Custer on the 1874. Black Hills Expedition. Gold was discovered on French Creek near what is now called Custer, Custer, South Dakota. And it was 1875 when plaster gold was found here, near here in Deadwood Gulch. And by the next year, as you can imagine, gold rush hit, the word had got out, and piles of wagons filled with hopeful dreams flooded in here. And it was then that the town of, of Deadwood was formed. Most of those coming here were poor, using any means possible to support their families, just needed to get here, even if it meant the great dangers and privations that came along with it. And I'm talking about the dangers, of course, of the Oglala Sioux. This was their sacred land. Treaties were broken. So a lot of people were, were killed in many battles and ambushes. Now when they came here, predictably many of the people that came here were late to the party, so to speak. They, you know, all the good claims were taken so they had to take what jobs they could. The smart ones would open stores like selling mines, picks, or picks, shovels, and mining equipment. But a lot of them would turn to gambling and crime. So this was a very dangerous place back in those days. A lot of people were Murdered, of course, many people died in mining accidents and things like that, but it was, it was, a, this was a tough place to be. And the crime was getting worse and worse. Claim jumping, robbery, murder. So who was Kitty Leroy? Let's talk a little bit about her. Not much is known about her younger days. We do know that Kitty was born in Michigan in 1850, and it is said she began her wild career when she was only 10 years old. Can you imagine? 
She married a man named Captain E.H. Lewis of Bay City there in Michigan. But in 1872, she left him. She was bored, so she did it. She did what most would do. She came out west, but she would first go to California. It is there that she would begin performing as a public dancer, mostly in the boom towns. But in the winter of 1875, 1876, Kitty was engaged at Thompson's Variety Den. In Dallas, Texas, she had found her way to Dallas. She was moving around, and while there, she caused quite a sensation with her lewd dancing. Of course, in those days, that was not acceptable, kind of like the fan dancers we talked about. She would leave there running away with a saloon man and head to California. But she'd only stay there a few months, and she'd come here to Deadwood. It was noted in an anonymous Black Hills letter that while she was here, she was a, and these descriptions you have to laugh, that they say she was a jig dancer with a small figure, a large Roman nose, cold gray eyes, a low cunning forehead, brown thick hair and curling, and she was inordinately fond of money <laughs> and we're talking gold not only did she have a distinctive look but it is said that she would gather in the men's money like no one else here she was like a magnet and they all wanted her She would play upon the weak strings of men's hearts. And she would do that until all was gone. And I'm talking about the money, the gold. She would take their money. She would, they say, take her character and sometimes even their life indirectly. She was married several times. Her first husband was a polite and intelligent German. We don't have a name but it was said that he was doing well with his gold claim. And of course she knew it. And like a spider, she spun her delicate little web around him until he poured into her lap $8,000 in gold. Now that's a lot of money back then. By today's terms, it's a lot of money. When his claim would yield no more gold, it is said that <laughs> she beat him over the head with a bottle and then drove him from her door. Get out! One after another, she would marry until their gold ran out. Then she would discard them like poker cards into the muck. They say that she had seven revolvers. Now, he got some tall tales. She had a dozen Bowie knives and always was armed to the teeth. Well, I don't know about that, but she definitely was able to keep the wild residents here who came to her places under control. The saloon and gambling den. And speaking of gambling, she was a... She was a, a really good gambler. Just imagine the talk at the table. She wore these huge diamonds on her ears while she drove her lovers crazy. They say more men were killed about her than all the other women combined in these Black Hills. As I said, she dealt Pharaoh she played all the games, and they say she had a dexterity that amounted to genius. Now, one evening, Kitty would get into an argument with her latest man, and she wasted no time and got herself hitched. To another man right away, his name was Samuel Curley. 
and he was a noted faro dealer, somewhat famous. But that didn't go so well. They were always arguing. Their neighbors could hear the yelling and the fighting, and they could hear banging, the physical abuse, mutual physical abuse. Though one day Samuel moved to Denver, he needed a break from Kitty. At first she was depressed. She wasn't friendly to anyone. She missed him. She didn't want to be a failure in a marriage. But as time went on, she would heal, her attitude changed, and she opened a brothel and gambling house, and it is there where she would sit and work the faro table, and she would become her best, take a lot of money. She would get back to her old form, relieving a lot of gold from a lot of miners. It was rumored that she took pot shots at over a dozen gamblers for cheating over the term of her ownership of this establishment. By the fall of 1877, she started carrying on with one of her old boyfriends at the Lone Star Saloon. And they eventually moved in together. Samuel was still away. He had, by this time, set up shop in Cheyenne, Wyoming, he had a real nice saloon there, Pashi. He was working the faro table, but he went ballistic when he heard this. The word got to him and started brewing his anger and escalating. And then he started to hatch a plan. At first, it was more of a dream a fantasy, but it was going to hatch into a real plan. He was going to get back at her. He was going to get his revenge. So he secretly came back here on a stage, Deadwood, under an assumed name. He even wore a disguise. It was December 6th, 1877. He got off the coach just south of town here, Deadwood, and he told the driver, don't say that I was with you. Apparently the stage driver had recognized him. Don't tell anybody. Well, he ended up coming down Main Street and he walked straight ahead to the hotel where Kitty was staying. He wasn't going to waste any time. He waited there all day. Apparently she was not there, so he sent word to his rival, her boyfriend, to come see him. I don't have a name for that guy, but he was lucky. Well, maybe it was that he was smart because he didn't go. He did not accept the invitation. He knew there was probably an ambush waiting for him. So Samuel told one of the employees there, he said, you know what, just to let you know, I'm going to kill Kitty, and then I'm going to kill myself. And he was true to his word. He actually did it. Downstairs, they would hear two gunshots. They would run up the employees. They'd run up the stairs. They opened the door, and there was Kitty. She was laying on the floor on her back. They took a close look, and they said that she had a quiet facial expression on her face, no terror, just peaceful. They took a closer look and they saw a small bullet hole in the waist of her dress, which, upon undressing her, showed that there was an entry wound in the center of her chest. And that was the exit wound. There on the opposite side, 
on the floor lay the murderer, Samuel Curley. He followed through with his death wish. He lay there in contorted fashion, face down in a huge pool of blood. His brain was oozing out right there in front of them. Pieces of his skull were protruding from his, his horrific wound. And bloodstains, as they looked around, were splattered all over the door, all over the walls. It was a disgusting mess. His right arm was doubled up behind him. And in his hand was clutched a Smith and Wesson. He did it. He did the deed. Well, a funeral was held for them down in the valley here in Deadwood. They were both encased in separate wooden caskets together. They were both buried at the same time at the Ingleside Cemetery, but later they were exhumed and reinterred here at Mount Moriah as I said, in unmarked graves. According to the January 7, 1878 edition of the Black Hills Daily Times, a day before her death, Kitty had drawn a will in holographic ink. Did she know this was coming? You have to wonder. She had an estate of about $650. That's all she had left. Still a lot of money of those days. And they used a portion of those funds to pay for the service, the burial. And at the time, there was a, there was a tombstone, of course, at Ingleside. And there they would not rest in peace. It seemed that Kitty would not rust after they were lowered into these graves here. In fact, neither one of them would rest in peace. And the locals will tell you they see their spirits. They see their spirits here in particular fashion at the Lone Star Saloon, hauntings. Patrons recently say that both phantoms would appear to recline in loving embraces, sit in the chair, and then they would slowly melt away into the shadows of the night. Yeah. They are still haunting Deadwood, guys. They're still haunting this place. Well, you have to wonder, you have to wonder if they, well, first of all, you have to wonder, where are they here? We know they're here. I don't think there's a pauper section. They could be buried way up the hill. They could be anywhere. But I think they're here because, and I don't think anybody knows where they're at. And the reason I say that is because if they did, if the locals here, you Deadwood folks, knew where they were buried, you would have a sign there. Like, I know you're embracing the, the legacy and the history of Deadwood, and they're a big part of it. So all I can say is if someone does know and it was handed down through generations, maybe, yeah, maybe someone will come forward. Maybe they'll get added. Maybe what, uh, either way, found or not, they'll get added to the list of the notable people here. Or maybe not. What a beautiful place this is. All right. From Deadwood. We've got more stuff to do here. 
from the Black Hills, in the Black Hills. Stay safe, everybody, and rest in peace to Kitty Leroy.